I see in the sculpture is, um, <laughs> I don't know, uh, I don't know, it just looks like uh, a mass of metal, pretty much. Well, I heard it was to break the wind from the green building. It's metal. It's, I don't. I don't know anything about it. I, oh, maybe it looks like a bird. Maybe it's um, part of a ma mathematical curve, or some um, function, you know, some part of a sine wave or something. I don't know. It's just there. Uh, I don't think it has much meaning. I don't, just, it's just it's just there. The concept of the sculpture has been a four-piece sculpture with the grandparents and grandchildren. Because there were four statues, it was, I felt, important from the beginning to have uh, uh, some center the uh, piece more than others. And uh, uh, each statue actually has a particular role in, in the uh, uh, group as it st stands now. The uh, man is the uh, pillar or the, or the center of the composition. And also, psychologically, the man is the uh, stiffer of the two adults. He doesn't seem to have reacted to the situation as quickly as the woman who's bending over more and uh, reaching out in what some say a more emotional uh, fashion. But uh, it's from a purely abstract point of view, the uh, the uh, thing I wanted to achieve was more movement uh, with, with the woman and the kind of a, a centering or a static quality with the man. To me, it speaks of motion, activity, expression, and reaching out. And I would say that if I had to sit here by myself, I wouldn't be alone. I have company. Some people in the community, uh, especially uh, some of the little children, seem to uh, respond very, very quickly to the movement and action, the uh, readily identifiable uh, difference uh, between the statues. The fact that the girl is running uh, more than the uh, boy, that seemed to be a uh, interesting way of making the uh, assets, the abilities, from one generation kind of cross over uh, flowing into another generation. So there's no generation gap. One would listen to the other and learn and feel. There's no space between young or old. I have no uh, terribly original view of public art. I think it's art meant to uh, uh, embellish buildings uh, uh, to uh, uh, to decorate in some permanent way public spaces, uh, squares, and uh, parks, and so on. I would consider a, a more important problem than public art as such uh, the aesthetic quality of uh, a city or a town, the quality of its buildings, its layout. Uh, the ambience. One of the problems of public art is even though we want to uh, make a point out of a square or a uh, or a vista, uh, we very often, owing to what has happened to modern art, uh, introduce uh, pieces of art that uh, don't particularly speak to people, that don't tell them why it's there proposed uh, pieces of public art by Clay's Oldenburg, which consist of a giant uh, clothespin or a giant uh, toothbrush or, or a giant baseball bat. He tends to put giant things in places. And that's amusing. And I think amusement is one uh, 
purpose of public art. Public art became important because otherwise uh, the cityscape, the townscape, the, uh, the city street became just too boring. Community-oriented public art stems from the desire to experience an, uh, an event or an aesthetic experience, to, to feel that art can celebrate the community and to engage them in, in ideas that might be generated only within that context. Uh, I just feel that the source of the public should be considered as, as a form that would actually infuse inspiration into the work itself. So for me, engaging the community, engaging whether it's in a neighborhood or in a downtown section is uh, extremely valuable because it, it relates to that type of understanding the public will have in the realm of art. I believe successful public art engages the public in an educational and creative process where the public can participate. I think the definitions of public art are too narrow and I wish that the definitions could include performance art and even um, all the use of uh, uh, lobbies for example for for temporary exhibitions. I mean I think we should loosen this up. It's a subset of art and you know just to be plain about it it's art that's out in the public meaning the public are shared collective existence. Public art is something that the artist gets paid for and uh, the gallery art or the art on uh, that you do in your studio and then hope to sell usually doesn't uh, get paid for. Newer thinking is to design the piece for the site. We call this site specific. The best we have of that is the Maya Lin Vietnam Vets which is essentially a minimalist shape that she's used but, but imbued it with enormous significance and, and, and very deep and painful meaning for us. Uh, sometimes the message is ambiguous. So they uh, say that about the Vietnam Memorial. But uh, at least one message is not ambiguous. It celebrates uh, uh, the people who died. But modern sculpture, because it is not representational, it doesn't show, uh, you know, it's not going to be the Statue of Liberty, it's not going to be uh, uh, General Sherman on a horse, it's uh, not going to be a soldier uh, or a warrior. It's very hard for it to make its point. It's very hard for it to communicate to people what it is trying to say. It's easy to express heroism um, for example, uh, if you have a group of soldiers surging forward in the face of opposition. But how do you express heroism if you are uh, Henry Moore? First of all, every, everything looks the same, you know, the same object with a whole. And one is heroic and one is uh, supposed to represent sadness for the, for the assassination of a great leader. How can you tell? You, you see that... Uh Obviously, from different angles, you have a different interpretation. So you can see as a, like a girl sitting there reading something, and the skirt flies away, and you can you can imagine use your stretch your imagination. So also, what I see in the object is a man and a woman, very contemporary. That's it. Uh, what I see in the object, I suppose, are I don't know, mildly human forms, but not really. I mean, some abstraction of it. I mean, it has curves like a human form, so I automatically think of figures, but obviously it isn't. Perhaps she's sitting there overlooking the river with the water of the river flowing along with her back to campus. Well, they're probably having some sort of sexual encounter, I guess. Maybe with her knees sticking out. I kind of like the object in the space it is because it's in such an orthogonal space that the curves break up the space, whereas this sculpture, I could say, I don't like it there because it's too geometric. How do I account for the fact that the artist has one thing in mind and the public uh, 
has a very different reaction and doesn't know what he has in mind. Whatever he has in mind doesn't like it. And that's a very common thing. Possibly the most celebrated uh, event in the history of recent public art in uh, the United States is the controversy of uh, Richard Serra's tilted arc in New York. A curving wall of uh, steel built in a, uh, a square of square shape surrounded by federal office buildings. Uh, one effect of this wall, which I observed when I visited it, was that no matter which building you came out of, you couldn't see any other building. So even though some of the buildings had nice decorated facades, all you saw was your uh, tilted arc uh, moving away from you. The tilted arc controversy has certainly pointed out um, the, the underlying social antagonism towards non-representational art that exists in this country. It was always there. Nobody ever kidded themselves that it wasn't, but, but all the forces were, were organized to get this work out because people felt threatened by it. And uh, it wasn't just because it interrupted their Frisbee games. There was something about it which, because of its, its plainness, its surface of steel, its dark qualities, its largeness. Um, there was something threatening about it, and, and people were unnerved by this. Uh, it made them uncomfortable. And, you know, one definition of art is that it makes you uncomfortable. It should make you uncomfortable. There's nothing wrong with that. You don't have to be reassured all the time. A lot of it has to do with kind of a, a sense of, of collapse. You know, these big structures look like they could fall over. So there's this always kind of like like anxiety that's created around his work. So, I mean, it seemed like that's exactly what, what happened. It just made people more and more anxious. Uh, another problem was there was no place to put a bench because it moved from one uh, diagonal corner of the arc to the other. And uh, so, uh, so people couldn't sit on it. Didn't feel like sitting under it because it just blocked the sun. And so they would sort of wander around us constantly and not have a place to eat their sandwiches. They had a very human response to Tilted Ark. Tilted Ark was a, a most inappropriate object in its place. It, when uh, the, uh, the organization that takes care of federal buildings, which had commissioned this work, said uh, there's so much opposition that we're going to take it away. He sued, and it were, it, it, we, they appointed many committees of artists and others. They went to court. And it took about four or five years, and finally they had the right to take it away. They said they would find a better place for it. I think one of the things that happened is the artist has become more and more uh, internal in what he thinks is appropriate art, or she thinks appropriate art. The art becomes so removed from its intention, its intention either as amusement, embellishment, or celebration, that it, it, it doesn't make its point. One of the ways that art could be made more accessible and more meaningful is for community involvement, community planning, a kind of outreach and educational programs that ought to be connected to the installation of a new piece. Welcome to International Off-Season Baseball. Yay! <laughs> Another of Jerry Beck's crazy dreams that came true. The last project I was engaged with um, was entitled What Will the Neighbors Say? And it was a series of public art projects that directly responded to the community. And be, not being from that community, one of the challenges that I was faced with was what type of public art can I initiate which can bring the community together. So when I looked around what was happening during the summer, I noticed the largest activity that involved the community was around the ball fields. And sports kind of transcends the political and social realm. And, and kids know how to play sports, and everybody understands that. So what I picked was baseball. And the project was a large-scale project that involved me working with uh, several after-school programs with kids and using baseball as a metaphor to discuss social and environmental issues. So we built uh, about a 150-foot baseball bat 
that contained a pitching booth and a hitting machine and you came up to bat and there was a series of opponents that we that represent evils in in the community like drugs and racism and sexism etc and you came to bat to kind of get a hit against them so this was a way for me to incorporate the idea of game uh, as a way of of kind of teaming up to face these these opponents. And then we had a big opening day where we had a series of ball games that brought together all the all-stars from the kids leagues and we had performances, dance performances involving kids and uh, some community leaders showed up and we gave awards out. We also had a special exhibition called the Hall of Game and this featured all the artwork created by the kids. We had about 200 works of art. What we were trying to stress was that not just the uh, what you do on the field is important, but what you do off the field. So we wanted to have the kids understand that every act they did during the day was important. And when we had all those come together, it was just a beautiful feeling to be involved with because the community um, gathered around this piece as it was theirs. And, and every day I had um, new arrivals from other kids from the community. And by the end of the project, we must have uh, engaged uh, hundreds of of community members and family members and uh, it was just a real complete project. I know that there's always the danger of what uh, modern art critics or art critics call kitsch, something too sentimental, too obvious and so on. And that's a danger, but there's a danger on the other side, something so remote that uh, no one will notice it and if they did notice it, they didn't know what it's all about. It wouldn't amuse them, it wouldn't enlighten them, it wouldn't lift their spirits, it would do nothing for them. The biggest mistake is to say that uh, art should include ingredients from, from all elements. Uh, usually great art does, but you can't, you can't legislate it, you can't uh, control it, you can't, uh, you can't make a rule about it. If we go back to our childhood, we can always remember times that we were inventive, times that we were innovative. We built our tree forts. We came up with imaginary games. We, uh, we scanned the neighborhood for, for people to play with. Um, and it continued in school. And in our society, we haven't really fostered the type of consideration that creative process um, can provide for changes in our society. And I see public art as being a way to really um, maximize the type of communal celebration, communal education, to fight some of these evils that our communities and our world are facing. And there's nothing wrong with decorative public art if it's done well. And there's nothing wrong with useful public art like benches. And there's nothing wrong with, you know, in theory, anything, but it has everything to do with with um, how the place, the use, the history, the people uh, are are invited to make meaning out of it for themselves. That's all. It's only got to be an invitation. <laughs>